if you had have asked me when I was st starting that one of the first exciting opportunities, commercial and investment that came up with that Coca-Cola would want to have our CO2, you know, to use to carbonate their beverages, I would not have really believed it. Hello and welcome to Leaders on a Mission the podcast that brings you face-to-face -face with trailblazing leaders reshaping our world. I'm your host, Simon Leach, and today I'm really thrilled to be joined by Rory Brown, CEO of Airhive, to talk about his pioneer, pioneering advancements in the direct air capture technology space. So Rory is going to share his insights on tackling climate change and scaling a UK green tech company. Uh, Rory, thanks so much for joining me today. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. So looking forward to the conversation. Excellent. And uh, look, tell me, maybe we'll start and we'll take it back a little bit, you know, before uh, founding Airhive. You know, maybe just talk through, a, I suppose, a couple of impactful moments from your career prior to this journey, as it were. Yeah, I mean, I... Um yeah, so I, I did about 15 years in, um, broadly speaking, you might call it the international development world, or, but really it was sort of in the conflict and security bit. So I did a lot of um, work around stabilization, as, they, as it's referred to in conflict zones, uh, counterterrorism, countering violent extremism, so no, um, no, let's say, a above average amount about um, insurgency and terrorism, speak a couple of Middle Eastern languages, um, and, uh, and spent, yeah, close to a, a decade and a half in the Middle East, South Asia and, and East Africa. Um, I think, um, it was at times exhilarating, at times completely exhausting, you know, often very hard, um, very uncertain, lots of risk and personal risk too. So, you know, you, and a lot of time feeling a bit insecure, you have friends who die, um, it can sort of wear people out. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think like, but you know, the, the reason you do it is because you think that, you know, matters of war and peace and the well-being of people in the middle of difficult conflicts is a something of great importance. And so, you know, it, what was sort of, I guess, most fulfilling about it was um, feeling like what you were doing really mattered, um, that it was very mission driven, uh, and to be able to see where you did have a tangible difference, which is sometimes quite rare, you know, because you, you might just be on the losing side, you know, uh, things fail, you know, a lot in the, in that, in that world. Um, but when you do see sort of tangible positive impact, even down to just a few individuals whose lives have meaningfully changed um you know is a is a really kind of uh is a really rewarding and i think that's sort of read through into this you know from the conflict into climate is a quite you know that's also a mission driven space and it matters and there's a lot of risk at the kind of planetary level so you know in the startup world in a very different form of course um but you know so i think there's a kind of couple of interesting ways that reads across I think. Absolutely. But tell me, though, before Airhive, you know, when you were considering that transition outside of that, what was climate something that was on your agenda, uh, at, you know, at the time? Or was it something you stumbled across? And, you know, how did how did that happen, that transition happen? Yeah, I think um, so. I, you know, my mother is a naturalist and my father a geoscientist and environmental scientist. So actually, it was sort of very much in the bloodstream from quite both the sort of scientific, but also the well, the more rooted in nature perspective so you know i was one of the options in my career I, you know when going through university thinking about doing something on climate was was there right at the start um i think i was I call it i call it sort of i was part of the 9 11 generation people who sort of had a political awakening around that and um and then the iraq war was very live you know afghan war too so I, it ended up not being the thing that i did initially and but you know, while doing that work, you really, you know, I increasingly became very conscious of the really tangible way in which climate change 
was having an effect in places like that. So, you know, droughts becoming more frequent, flood events becoming more frequent, weather patterns being destabilized. When you do these like country level assessments often that help you work out what your specific kind of intervention is in a conflict or a, you know, or a sort of um, yeah, civil war, whatever it might be. Um, you know, often you are looking at some of the structural factors that make conflict more likely. It might be political dysfunction. It might be, you know, uh, grinding poverty and climate change was sort of increasingly factor that you know, factoring in as well. And the one really notable moment I remember we were working in the presidential uh, president's office in in Somalia, and it came across the national security advisor, uh, his desk, you know, a report from. The Notre Dame, the university in the States, puts out a report every year that says, what, you know, how, ranking the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. Somalia was literally at the bottom of the list or top of the list, as in the most vulnerable. And they're like, what do we do with this? Which is like, I don't know. I remember sending it to my dad and being like, you know, could you interpret this a bit for me? And he was like, yeah, I mean, the, the quick capsule summary is it's really grim, you know. And so you became very conscious of that. You, you might do... All this effort on trying to resolve a conflict, you know, where you're talking over time frames of years, but you come out the other end and it might be that climate change has made that country, you know, fundamentally unlivable, unviable, no water, you know, can't grow crops, you know, d desertification, you know, all, all of that stuff. So it became much more of an active and real part of, of the career and st in such a way that I stopped being able to look the other way about it, which is kind of what I did for a while because like you'd see the headlines you think this is just way too big a thing to deal with when you know the day job is quite hard um yeah it stopped it i stopped being able to to, to um to, to have the sort of blissful ignorance position you know. got it no thank you for explaining and uh, and and then how did airhive come about or when you were kind of i suppose in that transition phase to talk through that kind of journey yeah, so um, I moved back to the UK just before COVID with the intent of a few different things, but one of them was to go and do a climate degree somewhere. So I did a part-time degree with what ended up being my final job, um, which is a Yemen-focused job uh, uh, um, at, at University College London on kind of climate and energy. And I you know, came into it knowing absolutely nothing really like Zippo. Um, but it was a fantastic, you know, to do a proper rigorous academic degree is, you know, it's not just a kind of in career transition. It's, you know, they sort of get you to start from, from the ground floor and build up, you know, and, um, I think a big thing what the UCL does is what's called integrated assessment modeling, which is the kind of big global models that look at the pathways of emissions reduction and sort of energy tra transition of technologies to get us to a level of emissions that are consistent with stabilizing the climate. And the big thing that kind of st stood out to me when working with those was the scale of the role that is being played by what's called carbon removal technologies. Um, and that is, uh, you know, things like direct air capture, but other types of approaches as well that directly remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And I guess, it, you know, there was some, there was a nice symmetry in that. Um, so those models said there's a huge amount of this that's needed. And this was at a time there wasn't a single commercial plant operational in the world, effectively zero actual carbon removal or close, uh, as close to. Um, it mirrored that way that, you know, in my old job, it was like you have a strategic assessment and you'd say, what is the sort of intervention that you think actual sort of tactical intervention that would have the most effect? And so, I guess that um, that was a the sort of central pathway to arriving at the conclusion of let's do a DAC startup, knowing nothing about engineering, not a technologist, never done anything in sort of startups or, or anything in the background. But um, that was the conclusion, I guess that that I that that I arrived at. Got it. And what was the process after that then, in terms of because you would have met a co-founder, right? I think you've got a co-founder yeah. in the business, yeah. so. You know, from from knowing that, okay, there's an opportunity here in the space. I'm curious to see what that looked like in order for you to end up co-founding a company. Yeah, I, I mean, not dissimilar to previous efforts. We, you know, build a team often quite rapidly in order to 
um, you know, meet some particular objective. And in this case, it was get a founding team, get some, you know, uh, you know, get how sort of figure out what is the technological approach that we'll be taking, and what is a target-rich environment for engineers who might be really good at direct error capture. And the answer, at least in my case, was. Um, Imperial College chemical engineering PhD students who might be wondering, you know, what can we go and do that's really impactful in the real world after we finish this really rigorous academic training. And actually, that continues even with many of the new team members that we're recruiting at the minute. You know, it's a the UK universities are you know, some of the best in the world. Um, the quality of people coming out of them looking to do really impactful stuff in climate and a whole bunch of other areas is just amazing. I mean, it, you know, it's been a wonder to all the, the you know, people who are a decade younger than me. And I say that only the, to say that, you know, 10 years younger, but like streets ahead of me, you know, not just on the engineering side, but in some of the kind of ways that this, you know, some of the economic or sort of business training that they're loaded into those engineering degrees. So, yeah, it, it, in the first instance, it was searching on LinkedIn for uh, people in that department. And um, yeah, my co-founder, Jasper, was the second person that uh, that I spoke to. Um, right, so, okay. You know, lucky, I guess, is part, you know, you've got to have a bit of luck. You know. Oh, you're modest. You're too modest um, uh, around that. But uh, no, it's interesting to start with a blank sheet of paper, actually. And uh, so tell us a little bit about then Airhive in terms of, you know, what problems, you know, what problems do you solve? And just, yeah, talk through that a little bit, maybe. Yeah, I mean, um, so the, the weird thing about direct air capture is that, you know, it is a technology that really will probably only mature in the second half of the century. So, you know, we're talking about a decadal timeline and that you know it's true of the broader carbon removal world as well and you know maybe to some extent actually quite a lot of the climate technologies you know you're talking about hard to abate sectors like steel and cement you know all of that stuff will take decades to really actually get to a level of global deployment or penetration that you know that it's doing the lifting um and you, in the case of removals you are talking about annual removals of billions of tons of CO2, maybe cumulatively up to half a trillion tons this century um, in order to, you know, roughly they're about, depending on how we do on sort of the decarbonization side of the of the net zero balance sheet. Um, but it's a it's big and it's long term, but you know, um, and, and well, maybe I'll just back up and say specifically what it involves is it involves building big industrial machines that um, that process huge amounts of air and scrub the very dilute concentrations of CO2 out of that air. Um, and it's expensive and it's energy intensive. Um, that being said, those essentially are two kind of solvable human things. There's, you know, there's cost and energy, or, you know, so, Supply are, are not inherent biophysical limits of the Earth system. You know, there isn't some upper bound of the total amount of biomass that you can feed into it, which, uh, uh, or um, something in kind of the laws of physics that limit the amount. It's really, you know, the, you know, the, the cost and the energy that's required to then also basically build a really big industry that would needs to be, you know, maybe the size of the automotive sector today. But, you know, that is that is the scale at which we all need to be able to imagine and work towards um, in in order to meet the climate challenge. You know, it is... It is it's like a Moore's Law type of thing, like in time, the, mature, the, the, the maturing of the technology, you know, it's only going to go one way, right, in terms of the kind of cost uh, and the energy intensity in order to, 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 to for it to be commercially viable. Yeah, and, and you yeah. know... It, there are essentially there there is you know there are commercially it is commercially viable today in the very niche sense that there are a small number of people willing to buy carbon credits at those high prices talking in the hundreds of dollars a ton um, uh, and therefore you know they're essentially with a high willingness to pay and that's really valuable and important um, because it helps create the early stage 
of the industry. It's a bit like solar panels on you know NASA on sort of lunar, you know, or on um, space uh, exploration in the '60s. You know, a valuable market where you're willing to pay quite a lot to serve that to serve this, that a specific purpose, um, but which helps drive that price down kind of over over a years. Um, yeah, so I think um, you know, but, but it you know, it's also difficult, or it's also even if we're thinking over decades, we are also thinking, you know, how do we survive as a startup tomorrow, you know, next week, in a year's time, and so you know, you have a kind of long term mission, which in our case is to be a very large developer of direct air capture projects, to have our own technologies, and to continuously innovate, because it's probably the case that none of the DAC today is the best DAC that we will see, you know, even in the next decade, let alone, you know, 50 years. Um, but so, you know, we need to survive. So in the near term, you know, we have to be, you know, how do we scale quickly across a bunch of different ways, you know, a bunch of different markets, a bunch of different business models. Um, so we're thinking about, you know, ways in which that CO2 can be utilized in some cases uh, where there is actually an existing market for Industrial CO two as a as a gas. Um, uh, in our case, we're looking at beverages, um, and then also looking at you know, do we want to sell the technology to people where they're developing projects in their own jurisdiction, where they have an advantage around getting permits and knowing the local you know terrain and maybe community relations, etc. And so you know it sort of keep it we kind of keep it broad at the moment, but we will be narrowing towards. You know, essentially something like a large, um, you know, industrial, uh, you know, corporation, but whose mission is to you know remove carbon at you know at, at sort of scales of billions of tons a year. Yeah, I've got it. No, thank you. Um, and I read on your your website you've got some innovation in the technology in terms of if you're comparing DAC and. Um, and you know, looking at competitors or other companies that do stuff, I was reading about some of the. Am I right in thinking it's a fluidization kind of technology, which which helps you become more effective and efficient in, in your capture? Is that is that is that how, how you say it? Yeah, that's right. I think the original innovation for us was in the in the what's called the yeah the capture system. So it's a two stage system. The first, you process huge amounts of air, and then you bind the CO two either physically or chemically into a uh, into some kind of captured material, uh, whether liquid or solid, and then you treat that material in such a way that you get a pure stream of CO two comes off. The material is kind of then returned to its CO two philic state, and then you sort of then go back to capture. So for us. We use something called a fluidized bed, which is a, a pretty well understood bit of industrial kit. That being said, it's well understood kind of more in industrial applications. The science and the modeling of it is actually quite hard. So there's quite a niche group of people in the academic sort of scientific community that really understand it to an advanced degree. And my co-founder comes from, you know, a PhD and a research group that is in, in that kind of quite niche area. Um, it was described recently to us by one of our manufacturing partners as a dark art um, fluidization because it is mostly built up from years of, you know, just actually people building and operating that kit in industrial context rather than, um, you know, being kind of driven by, you know, the sort of frontiers of, of science and, you know, for the most part. There is advancement, but it is, as I say, quite a niche thing in the, in the academy. Um, so that's a real, I, I mean, won't go too much into too much detail about why it's advantageous, but I would say that basically it, the key thing is it allows us to process, we think, very, very high amounts of air compared to other solutions with a low energy penalty um, for doing that because your sorbent, your our capture material, it basically flies around in our in our capture vessel rather than being fixed in place and having to push kind of where you have to push the air against that sort of fixed uh, bed of material. Um, and then um, we have some novelty also in, in the material science, um, uh, is in the materials that we use. Uh, and then also in, in the, the, so we then heat the material once it's, the CO2 has been bound in. Um, and we have some novelty in the designs of the, of the, the, the sort of 
um, the thermal step as well as the heat recovery to really kind of drive the the, the energy that we use down to a very competitive level too. Um, I would say broadly, there is a lot of kind of innovation in the DAC world and also in the removals world, and that's fantastic. And we need it, you know, and we'll have that kind of natural creative destruction process over the next few years, where you know a few I think will will um, survive and do well, and and others will have contributed to a kind of wider mission of you know helping work out what is the right technology. Because people have taken lots of different you know. Uh, approaches, many of which overlap and, and you know there's probably sort of five, six main buckets of, of tech in the DAC world. Got it. Yeah, it sounds like a really quick move, well, moving innovative space. And your point earlier about the tech will develop over the next few years. I suppose have you got an idea of where it's going to develop or what the breakthroughs will be? Uh, you know, just at a high level. So, so I think that there's going to be there's going to be some really interesting um, innovation, and I think the central point is that there won't be one winner. Um, you know, there will net naturally, you know, a bit like look at automotive today. Look at you know any in heavy industrial sector, and there are kind of multiple companies working, you know, with. Similar but distinct technologies, designs, IP, you know, often a bit geographically segmented or, um, or segmented by, you know, sort of kind of use cases. Um, I think uh, so, you know, if you are trying to operate in very cold conditions or very hot conditions or you, you know, need lots of water or very little water or um, the humidity in the air makes a difference to the performance of your process. Uh, or you've got, you know, a higher price of energy, and therefore it's more important that you use less energy. You know, at the margin, um, you know, th there will be a few different ones. So there's sort of broadly speaking, yeah, you know, just say four or five buckets. There's chemical looping processes or, or carbonate looping processes. That's the one that we sit into, which typically involve a thermal regeneration. Um, there's electrochemical, which usually is liquids, and then they have non-thermal electrochemical regeneration. There are those using synthetic sorbents like amines or metal organic frameworks, um, which are uh, pissy sorbents, and therefore they you know, either uh, you, you usually use a kind of low temperature regeneration process. And then there's others that do things uh, like moisture swing. So they don't eat the materials. They, they push, basically change the humidity and it, it, it releases the CO2 uh, or swings back and forth. So there's kind of a, there'll be a, a, a range of approaches, I think, across the sort of those main buckets and a few others. Um, and, you know, ultimately that diversity will be helpful for, you know, the alignment to sort of conditions in specific places. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to hear and uh, to get into a bit of detail around you know, around that, um, you know, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex space for sure. Um, but tell me back to kind of Airhive, let's talk through a little bit around, you know, the, your vision for the company and maybe some of the kind of key milestones um, that have been achieved so far. Yeah, so, I mean, long term, our plan is, as I say, to, you know, be a large developer of direct air capture and maybe other removal or sort of carbon technologies. Um, and we're really kind of excited to you know, begin, I think in the relatively near future, that next stage of kind of innovation, you know, looking at additional technologies, maybe the next sort of tier out from the core that we're doing at the moment, as well as continuing to innovate in direct air capture specifically. Um, I think that you know, we don't want to be acquired fundamentally. We would like to either, you know, get very large and stay private or get very large and go public. That's the kind of long-term strategy. Um, I think it, it's important that there are people that are large independent developers of these technologies, um, but uh, um, but there'll be lots of different routes for people. You know, so uh, there's, again, there's probably not, there's, Definitely not one right business model. So, but that's sort of, I guess, where we uh, where we see it. No, no quick exits. Um, we're sort of in it for the long haul, and we want to be in a situation where we can you know, deliver big 
megaton scale projects kind of, you know, in the next decade. Um, in terms of the milestones to date, so, you know, it's been effectively as of last week, actually, kind of two years for us. Um, and then we've got a very busy few months ahead. So we have a um, 60 ton pilot, the sort of first proper pilot scale system arriving in August that we're commissioning in the north of England. Um, we then very quickly after that have a thousand ton system that is arriving to our site in Canada with run by our partners, uh, Deep Sky, who's a Canadian um, project developer of, of direct air and direct ocean capture. Um, that uh, system in turn is being evaluated for something called the XPRIZE carbon removal. So this is the uh, Musk Foundation backed carbon remo- removal XPRIZE that we were um, yeah, really thrilled to be like listed as one of the finalists for. So that'll be going in in, um, in September, commissioned in October. And so that, that's really exciting. And then, um, yeah, and then I think we'll be um, yeah, continuing to develop a sort of range of commercial projects that we've sort of already made. You know, that were, uh, probably half a dozen that are kind of in the early stages of development at the moment and you know, getting those up to kind of levels of partnership agreement or you know, moving them on to kind of more formal and engineering uh, and procurement construction over the next two years is kind of, you know, the next big priority. Thing. Got it. Yeah. Tell me, what do you see? I mean, it's, it's only been two years. I mean, it's uh, you guys have achieved an awful lot in two years. You know, certainly for you to talk about some of these projects that you're you're running now. When you consider scaling this, what what kind of size, what kind of tonnage makes sense for you longer term? You know, for instance, and how would you get there? Yeah. So I, I mean, a lot of that is sort of there's a, there's sort of technological dimensions to the path that we choose and there's also kind of commercial and financing ones I would say so you know if we want to remain independent in the sense of you know not acquired by you know wholly acquired by you know a, a, a large existing corporation we then can't use our own balance sheet for developing big projects right away right so that means that what we really need to do is we need to be deploying commercial projects where we're roughly speaking kind of adding a zero in scale every you know maybe we do two at the at the so the the, the system going into deep sky later this year is a thousand tons um we want to do a project in the sort of ten thousand tons per annum scale range next year maybe we do one or two others in that you know in that range but maybe at most and then kind of up to 50 to 100 um you know we submitted for a uk government project that's in the hundreds of tons um that would if were selected and you know if it's a long road of ahead would be in the um would be sort of launching at the end of the decade so it, it would be kind of working across multiple projects be risking the technology increasing the accessing you know debt financing for those projects um, in order to kind of eventually get up to scale where we would be doing kind of big you know, project financed industrial facilities. That's, Got it. I guess, okay. our, I guess our scaling route. Got it. Yeah. And, and would you say like, I mean, you spoke about in Canada with the deep sky kind of, um, you know, challenge. Are, are you looking very internationally, you know, at this then therefore, as opposed to service in the UK market? Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of funny thing, I guess, is if particularly if you're selling carbon credits, you know, they don't, there's no, you know, it's, you don't have to physically move the commodity around in that case. So you sort of do projects where the project fundamentals are favorable, economically, I mean, um, uh, and then you find buyers where the buyers are. So intrinsically, it's an international operation. Now, some people are choosing to focus on specific geographies and um, again, you know, lots of people have different views. Our, our view, I suppose, is that um, we want to be capable of, you know, evaluating and operating product, um, you know, projects in multiple jurisdictions. And I think there is there are multiple jurisdictions where um, projects are likely to be happening soon. You know, i.e., the infrastructure is ready, the sort of regulation, the government support is ready. So I, I think we don't see it as 
necessary to, to restrict ourselves, you know, sort of jurisdictionally at the moment and want to remain open to, you know, where are the best opportunities, wherever they might be. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, yeah. And how do you, what is your sense on how the UK is gearing up for this to support this type of, you know, investment into this infrastructure? Yeah, I think the UK has made some really interesting plans. I know that, you know, government wise, there's sort of a public sector, you know, there's a sort of funding constraint at the moment, um, given the fiscal position. Um, I think they put more money into DAC actually before most jurisdictions have. Uh, the Americans now sh- you know, showed up in the last year and a half with a very large amount of cash, uh, you know, to be provided particularly to, to DAC. Um, so that's interesting, and, I, and obviously there's a you know, that's a there's a big opportunity there. Um, but you know, UK is proceeding well. Um, there's maybe been some slight delays on putting in the sort of enabling tra- CO2 transportation storage infrastructure, but hoping that the sort of investment decisions on that gets taken this year, and that you know we're sort of on track for you know in three maybe four years time that um, those. CO2 storage sites are ready to go and that projects are, can then be built. Uh, so, you know, UK is, a, is an important um, jurisdiction for these projects. And, you know, we, we're very happy to continue to be based, you know, London-based. I think the talent is fantastic, even if we do a range of projects, including in the UK, by the end of the decade, you know, that will very much look like, look like success for us. And, uh, you know, here's hoping that... Um, that the new government here kind of continues and expands on, I think, the good foundations for support for removals in general and DAC in, in particular that uh, that have been laid over the last few years. Yeah, no, great. Thank you. And I, I noticed as well, like, um, you know, you spoke earlier a little bit about focusing the business or finding market on the, um, you know, industries that need a, a good source of CO2. And you've mentioned about the, the beverage um, the carbonated kind of beverages space. So tell us a little bit about that and, um, you know, your journey on that side. Yeah, so, I mean, it, you know, if I had have, um, if you had have asked me when I was st- starting that one of the first exciting opportunities, commercial and investment that came up with that Coca-Cola would want to have our CO2, you know, to used to carbonate their beverages, I would not have really believed it. Um, but um, no, I mean, really early on, like this was November 2022, um, you know, the, they were re- really on the front foot, spoke to, I think, I know a number of DAC companies did a sort of profiling where they're really keen to get air captured CO2 into their beverages and really pilot this at a significant scale. Um, yeah. In 2022, they were talking about you know, kiloton scale, I mean, thousands of tons a year worth of kit that would be there to support, you know, to, to, to provide them air captured CO2 as a large commercial pilot, which was big. It was big scale at that time. You know, I mean, other projects that are now much larger have kind of started to be built um, or come online. But at, at that time, it was really ambitious. So it was, you know, we started speaking then and then um, we're lucky enough to have, uh, uh, had them sort of choose us to to take forward a, a thousand ton commercial pilot whose designs would be, be fabricated at the moment um, that'll go into one of their plants, you know, one of their bottling facilities in Europe. Um, specifically, this is uh, Coca Cola Euro Pacific Partners, which is the sort of main uh, bottler for for Western Europe. Um, and you know, if that goes well, then you know we're excited to see the potential for kind of further. You know, scaling up of of systems, you know, at, at their facilities to provide you know more and more of the, their their annual CO two needs. I mean, there's not an obvious way to decarbon to 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 you can't have non fizzy fizzy drinks, right? So um, it's a bit like yeah, there's not an obvious way like with say EVs where you can replace you know the current source of it, the feedstock, you know, with something totally different. So um, it's a really cool niche market um which i think would be really great uh for us you know over this decade if, if things go well and you know we'll have a meaningful effect we're talking about tens 
even though hundreds of thousands of tons and that you know that's not a that's not a trivial amount of of, um, of co2 reduction now of course just to sort of be clear um, that co2 gets re-emitted but what you are doing is you're avoiding the additional extraction processing and transportation of co2 from fossil sources um, uh, by providing them with essentially recycled co2 so there is actually a significant decarbonization benefit um, for, for, from that. So it's really exciting. Can um, you explain how it gets um, re-emitted again then? It, well, because it, 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 you take the CO2, so all of the, the fizz in fizzy drinks is is essentially uh, CO2 that has been um, it, uh, injected into it, inserted into that. Not you know in all beer, but say in lagers, uh, for example, that's... Uh, CO2 is not part of the fermentation process. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a supplement. Um, it, it's an additional sort of ingredient put in. Um, so you know when it's drunk, it will be re-emitted. So it is not a it's not a way of storing that CO2 that we've captured. But what it does is it displaces the you know fossil derived CO2 that would otherwise have been you know, take, extracted, put into the drinks, and then emitted when those drinks are consumed. Got it. Yeah, no, great. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not bad for your first partnership, is it, really, in terms no, of, yeah. uh, the, you know, the space, uh, as it were. So how did you find those discussions and negotiations and just the, I suppose, the lessons in working with a company like that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was great, you know, the Ventures team there to have, you know, they're doing some really exciting investment in other innovations that help them in their you know, journey. Um, so, yeah, really cool stuff for like energy recovery from wastewater and you know, more efficient refrigeration and some automated vehicles for on-site stuff, you know, um, sort of, uh, uh, transport, et cetera. So, they, you know, there's a really great venture team on the front foot doing really cool stuff and putting checks, you know, good checks behind it. Um, uh, you know, I think they're on the front foot in general as a kind of corporate VC. And so, you know, um, it will be, you know, it, it was a you know, great, great. To see. We didn't, hadn't spoken to many kind of cor- corporate venture arms before and to have kind of understood that piece, we were sort of learning a bit as we were discussing and then eventually kind of negotiating terms with them. Um, so yeah, look, I guess look, learned a lot from that process, and have, you know got a really good relationship with them. They're on the board. Um, you know, I think they're. You know, we're excited to see where the pilot goes with them and and what that might look like in the future. And I would say that um, you know a mix of financial venture funds and corporate venture funds, where there's a kind of you know, is it can be a really healthy thing if. You know, for for a for a startup, because you get kind of, you know, it it broaden it diversifies and broadens out the nature of the kind of coalition of people that are all there to kind of help you scale. And particularly with the when corporates you know can act as a as a customer too, that's you know obviously hugely hugely valuable in providing you know sort of near term commercial traction and uh, you know and then revenue in order to uh, to to you know particularly if or say in our case, developing of those bigger projects with the storage and the credits is an intrinsically a longer process. Um, so, you know, there's some real advantage uh, from, from from that kind of commercial dimension to it too. Yeah, no, awesome, awesome. Just like kind of final question for me, just thinking about you know your personal journey, career wise, right? Uh, what have you found most challenging about being a first time CEO in this space? I think um, I was sort of. It felt about maybe three or four months ago that I finally felt like I, um, a bit like when learning a language. Like at some point, you're like, "Oh, I just speak this language now." You don't notice that you just haven't had to flip back to English or to ask someone what a particular word means. You know, so that it was like I knew what my I knew my instincts and my from my previous career and. It was like essentially kind of learning in this process how, where to trust them and where I needed to learn and take a different approach. Like, for example, I literally in my life never done zero sum negotiations before and stuff around 
investment and dilution that's a feels quite zero sum um but certainly at times um so you know there's there's been new stuff but it's sort of the time over a couple of years of like learning a lot of the new things you need to learn and then being able to kind of go back to trusting your instincts rather than having to kind of know oh am i getting this right is this how this works in this sector so i think that's been the most interesting bit and where you know it, where there was an extremely sharp learning curve for the first while certainly on the investment side i mean that's but yeah finally that feeling like it was all kind of bedding down and then you can get to a place where you can be a bit more instinctual about how you you know how, how you make decisions across the the sort of the range of the business that that was a really that was a really kind of edifying moment i guess when when i had that realization yeah. Oh, great. No, thank you for sharing. And that's, uh, this is a, it's been a fantastic conversation. Really thank you for coming on and sharing your insights into the innovative world of AirHive and the future of direct uh, air capture technology. You know, very interesting space. And uh, it wraps up another episode on Leaders uh, on a Mission. So we really hope that Rory's story and vision have inspired you as much as uh, they have me. So don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for more stories on leaders driving positive change. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next episode. Mm -hmm.